everyone. We're just going to let people come in and we'll get started in just a few. Thanks for joining us. Everyone is doing well on this beautiful evening. All right, I think actually we'll we'll go ahead and get started because I know we all have a lot to talk about and want to make sure that we get everything in tonight. Uh, so welcome to VMFA Fridays After Five Taste of Art. This evening we'll be talking about the Pacific Northwest, Oregon and Washington. My name is Celeste Feta. I'm Director of Education at VMFA and tonight I'm joined by several special guests. Um, Tom Bjornsson from Roanoke Valley Wine, uh, VMFA's own Liz Skirpin, who's a muse manager, and Greg Haley, our chef, is going to be joining us as well. Um, and uh, oh, I'm already getting a chat. Liz, you need more light on your face. We need to see you better. I'm going to put the blinds down. <laughs> Thanks, Birch. Um, so the four of us are going to be talking wine and art with you tonight, as I mentioned, from Oregon and Washington. Um, and if you've been here before, or even if you, and, or if you haven't, I'm just going to go over some logistics and reminders on how this webinar will work. If you're pairing wine with this program tonight, and hopefully you are, um, go ahead and open your bottles now. Uh, that will save you some time later on as we get into tasting. As a reminder, this is a webinar, which means that you can see us. However, we cannot see you. Um, I always say use that to your advantage as you like. Um, but it also means that we aren't going to be able to see you if you have a hand raised or your reactions. So we're going to ask if you have a question or a reaction or just want to say hi, please use the chat feature as opposed to the Q&A. Um, that way we're only looking at one box and keeping track of your comments and interactions. And if we, we will try to answer them live um, as we're talking. Um, and if we don't get to live, we'll try to answer in the chat. And all of us will be monitoring and trying to keep up with that, uh, those questions and observations or feedback. So appreciate your patience as we go through, through the chat box. So if everyone has that and ready to roll, got your wine, got your chat box open, uh, we're just gonna go ahead and kick things off and I'm gonna bounce over to Tom um, and who's gonna tell us a little bit about Roanoke, uh, where he works and his uh, time in the wine business a little bit and get us started with the first selection this evening. So welcome, Tom. Thank you, Celeste. Um, so um, yeah, I am a, uh, I'm a bit of a dinosaur in this business. I've been selling wine since 1981. Um, I've been doing this now for over 40 years. Um, I've been working for Roanoke Valley Wine Company for 16 years. Um, we are a uh, family owned, family run, um, relatively small wholesaler in the state of Virginia. Um, we were founded on um, Oregon and Washington state wines. The owners of our company uh, at the time were living in um, Seattle um, and they fell in love with Washington and Oregon wines. And when they moved back to Virginia, um, 20 some years ago to start raising their family and raising their children, they realized they couldn't get all of the wonderful um, Oregon and Washington state wines that they'd fallen in love with and they started importing them. And to this day, we have, um, I, I like to say, since I'm from New York, I, I like to describe us as the 1927 Yankees of the Oregon Pinot Noir portfolio. 
Um, we represent about 45 different producers from Oregon and um, six or seven from Washington State. And uh, we represent some of, the, some of the best guys and some of the most important guys. And in, more importantly, some of the most wonderful folks making wine from out in that direction. So perfect for tonight's tasting. Good. <laughs> so um, let's start with the first one. I'm gonna, it's, uh, we're gonna start in the state of Oregon with Bell. Um, I like to just, I put a wrong spin on this. I'm gonna let you say it, Tom, because I'm gonna- It's Belpont. Belpont. I want to turn into an Italian word, but it's not. <laughs> yes, uh, Belpont is, um, translates in French to beautiful slope. Um, Belpont is owned by Brian and Jill O'Donnell. Um, the, it is a relatively small estate. Um, this is a beautiful watercolor of um, what their vineyards and, and what their hillside looks like. Um, they farm 100% uh, organically. They always have. Uh, they are members of what we feel is a very important organization in amongst Oregon winemakers called the, uh, the Deep Roots Coalition, which is an organization which first and foremost is 100% non-irrigated vines. Uh, if you're going to pour a ton of water in your vineyard and pour a ton of water on your vines, all you're doing is training the roots of those vines to turn upwards back towards the surface of the soil for that water, as opposed to going straight down deep into the rock and into the, into the, uh, the soil of the vineyards where it's gonna get all of, its, um, all of its flavors and all of its idiosyncratic, in, 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 I can't say that word. Um, it, it's, a, it's a wonderful, wonderful organization. It's about 30 wineries. We represent about 20 of them. Um, it's, a, it's not a big uh, vineyard. You can see if you're looking at this map right now, I don't know if you can see when I move my cursor. Um, they are up in Yamhill Car Carlton, but they're right at the edge of Yamhill Car Carlton and Ribbon Ridge which is a teeny tiny little black spot um, right between the, the gray area and the deep red area. Uh, it's a very, very, very steep site. Um, I've been there three or four times now. It is not a fun climb uh, up, to the, uh, up to the top of the vineyards. He actually uses um, chickens and goats and sheep to control the vegetation between the rows, as opposed to um, uh, pouring herbicides and pesticides on the, on the property. Um, it's about as hands off uh, a farming method as you can, as you can do. Um, and then he does the same, same thing down in the, down in the winery. He, he doesn't want to put his stamp on the on the wines. He wants the wines to show you where they where they were grown and and where they where they grew up. Um, so. And this is the winemaker here. And this is Brian O'Donnell. Uh, Brian and Jill uh, were both uh, in the tech business in the early '90s, um, and they were both home brewers and met and realized that they had an affinity for, for uh, making beer in their basements and making wine in their basements and decided in um, 1994 to cash in and cash out and, and buy this piece of property up in, uh, up in Yamhill Carlton um, and plant, plant the vines and start making wine. They made, their, they made their first vintage in 1996. Uh, they made their first 100% estate vintage in 1998. Uh, in 2000, they, were tra they had transitioned completely over to 100% organic viticulture. And by 2005, they had trans transitioned over to 100% biodynamic viticulture, which is sort of an even higher level of organic farming. Um, 
They, um, they grow every single bit of fruit that they use. They, use. they buy fruit from some other vineyards, but Brian actually manages the viticulture and controls the viticulture in all of the vineyards that they, that they buy fruit from. Um, so the wine you're having tonight is about 50-50 his estate fruit and 50% and um, from friends of his and neighbors that are very close where he controls the viticulture from. Should we start trying this uh, selection, this Pinot Noir from 2018? Let's do it. So if you have it, I'm, I'm going to pour a little bit for myself. And, and I have to apologize ahead of time. I don't even have a bottle of this because we, we this is such a small production wine that I, I, I didn't feel right cutting a sample out of the out of out of what we had to sell to the to the people that we sell it to. So but this is it's it's what he consult he considers it his Wednesday night Pinot Noir. And I and I encourage you uh, all um, to go and visit the website for both Belpont and for the Kiona that we're going to do later on. Both of them are wonderful, wonderful websites, and they've they've both put a lot of work into their into their web contact. Um, he he calls this his Wednesday night Pinot Noir. Uh, it might be a little bit of a stretch for some people because it, it sells for a little bit more than Wednesday night wine for me. Um, but it's really, really pretty. It's really, really bright. Brian always gets great, great acidity in his wines because he's so high up on the on the slope where he is that he gets very, very cool nights. Um, and that always helps with the acidity levels in the wines. Um, but it's it's not a it's not a terribly complex or complicated Pinot Noir. Um, but it's you know, I like to say about wines like this. It might just be a one or a two note Pinot Noir, but they're both really, really good notes. And they're really, really, really pretty. I think it's by far not the most boring Pinot Noir I've ever had. Yeah. You think for what it does, it does a really good job at it. Yeah. I'm kind of in love with it for- Absolutely. For a really nice, easy drinking, but it has that acid, which is lovely and a little bit of spice to it. Um, we have a comment from Birch. She says, why does the blend of the two fruits, uh, why does he blend the two fruits instead of separate separate bottlings, which allow him to call an estate wine? Well, he does He does about six or seven different single vineyard Pinot Noirs. He does all of the guys up in Oregon. Most of them do a lot of different um, Pinot Noir. Uh, he makes six or at least six or seven different Pinot Noirs. And this is the one that he does that he can afford to do and sell at a at a reasonable price because he's he's buying some of the fruit as opposed to using all estate fruit. But he still controls the 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 viticulture in all of the vineyards that he buys the fruit from. It's all 100% organic. It's all 100% non-irrigated. Um, so it's you know it's it's pretty serious fruit. But he he gets the fruit that he buys at a what ends up being a little bit lower cost than what he grows on his own state. If that so makes that sense. The primary reason why he would do it is to keep costs down. For this wine, yes. I mean, every everybody everybody's got to have a a Wednesday night kind of Pinot Noir. Everybody's got to have something that they can sell for a little bit less than their expensive estate bottled fruit. And Tom, I have a question actually about the year on this. I mean, it's a 2018, you know, we're in 2021, you know, and maybe it just could talk about, you know, aging and, and why it's, why are we drinking in 2018 and 2021, you know, how far apart kind of. 20, uh, well, most, most of our wineries from Oregon are now in 2018 and 2019. Uh, 20, we're in a streak of about five vintages where it was, Oregon had really, really, really warm growing seasons and, uh, and not a ton of rain in September and October when they were harvesting. Um, 
this is 2018 is it's got more acid generally across the board than 16 and 15 and 14 um, because it wasn't it wasn't nearly as hot. Um, but this is this is basically the current vintage that's that's out there for for Oregon Pinot Noir. 2017. Some some people are just starting to release their 17s. Some part some people are releasing their 18s. A couple of people were already into their 19s because of demand and because of just needing to get wine out of their cellar. So as, if you're if you're drinking the wine at home and want to pop in some of your impressions in the chat, would love to hear them. I feel like this is like easy drink, very easy drinking. I'm gonna have another sip. <laughs> <laughs> it's easy drinking, but I like it because it has a backbone to it. That acid yeah. gives it such great structure. So it's mm -hmm. easy drinking, but it's not, you know. It's not boring at all. Not water wine. <laughs> no, 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 no. So, so to, to Susan's, Susan's question, is higher acidity a reflection of less pre precipitation? Um, it's not. Higher acidity is actually a reflection of cooler nights and cooler, um, cooler days at the end of the growing season. Um, when we get to the, um, when we get to the, the Kiona, um, one of the biggest deals in Washington state is the, the diurnal difference, which is the difference between daytime temperatures and nighttime temperatures. And when you have a, a major diurnal shift from daytime to nighttime, it causes the acid levels in the grapes to go up. And as you get higher in elevation in Oregon, you get more, you get more drastic diurnal differences between daytime temperatures and nighttime temperatures. Um, so that's a so so that's really why. The, where you get the higher acidity. Um, and there's a lot of other, uh, a lot of other things, soil composition and the type of the soil and the exposure and blah, blah, blah. But that's, but that's the beginning of it, if I can say that. Um, Do you see William Long says, why is irrigation versus non-irrigation such a big deal? Well, um, if you're pouring a ton of water, on your vines, um, all you're doing is encouraging those vines to come upwards towards the water. Uh, if you're not pouring water on those vines, those vines are gonna keep going straight down into the bedrock and into the soil. And, and they're gonna derive the flavors and the characteristics of the soil below them, as opposed to coming up to the upper levels of the soil. Um, if everybody, it, it, you know, if you get a Napa Valley, nothing against Napa Valley, you got a Napa Valley, there's a crap ton of water in Napa Valley. There's a lot of people that are pouring a lot of water on their vineyards in order to get as much yield as they can out of those vines. There's a reason why a lot of Napa Valley Cabernet tastes like a lot of other Napa Valley Cabernet. Um, you're you're going to end up with wines that taste exactly like your next door neighbor and the guy on the other side of him and the guy behind you and the guy in front of you if you're just if you're just pouring water there's a, there's a reason why if you go to some of the greatest wine producing regions in the world like burgundy and and rioja and and bordeaux where it's actually illegal to um irrigate your vines um because they want their wines to taste differently from um the wines down the a quarter mile down the road or half a mile in this direction. Uh, approximate elevation for these guys, I think it's about uh, 850 to 900 feet, um, which is which doesn't seem really high, but for uh, for that part of or Oregon is actually pretty high. Um, the sweet spot for elevation for Oregon Pinot Noirs is between 350 and 900. Above that, you really have a really hard time getting ripening. And below that, you get really jammy, juicy, ripe fruit. So another question, Tom, about the key characteristics of Pinot Noir. 
Uh, what's the difference between a Pinot Noir and other types of red wine? Oh, wow. Um, it's really pretty. Um, it's, it's, it's really hard to grow. Uh, it's really thin skinned. Um, it doesn't have generally as much jammy ripe fruit as Cabernet or Merlot or Malbec or things like that. Um, it's a lot more delicate. Um, it, it, it's, it's one of the nicknames for Pinot Noir is the heartbreak grape um, because it's really, really hard to grow uh, and it doesn't grow well in a whole lot of places. Um, it, it, it's, um, I used to say, I, I, I used to say I, I, I've been doing this for a really, really long time. Um, when you get somebody hooked on really, really good Pinot Noir, they will crawl across cut glass to find that same wine again. Um, you know, when you have your, your first truly great Burgundy or your truly great, great Oregon Pinot Noir, it's it's a different it's just a different ball game. Um, there's a reason why we've got 45 Oregon producers in our book and like five Cabernet producers in our book. Uh, how deep do the vines grow? Vines can grow 50 to 60 to 70 feet below the surface. So as we're enjoying this Pinot Noir. Um, let's talk about what it would go well with in terms of, of food. So, you know, Greg and um, Liz, what do we have selected here from a muse to pair with our Pinot? Yeah, we have our locally sourced pork shank and um, paella to go with that. Um, we thought because of the nice acidity of the wine, it makes it really fun to pair with, right? So it's gonna go with a lot of different foods because it'll cut through fat, it'll cut through anything with a kind of a, a that buttery nice flavor. And um, it's still, you know, a light red. So you don't have to pair it with something super huge. So we thought pork would be a nice pairing with this. Do you want to talk about the dish at all? Uh, sure. And, um, you know, not only the, the pork and, you know, just that, that unctuous uh, that you get, especially with this cup, which is the asabuco. Um, you know, the paella also brings, you know, other layers to it where you have just a little bit of the salty from the olive. And if you get that with a little bit of the saffron and the paella and um, just a little bit of, um, you know, I use a little smoked paprika as well. And you get all those things together and it really just makes mm -hmm. that, you know, pop. it really turned out well. It's lovely. And it's, you get a lot of different flavors to it, but it's not, um, it's not over the top in any way. And we were no, even no. surprised, we were testing it yesterday with the staff because we do a, uh, wait, not yesterday, Wednesday, because we do a wine class and we were seeing the, even the olives go really well with this rice. So you can get that, even that, um, uh, what am I trying to say? Oliviness, the brininess of the olives, yeah. <laughs> the oliviness. I like the ol oliviness works. Thank you. <laughs> From the olives still worked really well with the wine because the wine also has this great depth and earthiness. And um, yes, Birch, I agree. The better question is what would you not pair with it? So there's definitely yeah, a lot. Agreed. We also go for French fries really well here yeah. with them. We a little uh, Parmesan and herb French fries. Got some Reggiano okay. and some parsley. Yeah, and it's then, a very good combination. Yeah. Pretty much wine and French fries is the best meal ever. So. <laughs> I'm enjoying it. <laughs> I know I saw the olives in this dish and I was like, oh, those would taste so good with this wine. That's what yeah, they I'm do. Really well. Oh boy. Oh. Yeah, we were thinking anything with some earthiness, but then the brininess just worked super well. So yeah, it was lovely. That was a fun, uh, a fun wine class, a fun pairing class. <laughs> I feel like it's oh, yes. Sue's right. Yeah, Sue was here last night and she had the cocoa van and we tr she tried it with the cocoa van and said it was lovely. So oh, good. Yeah. Good. I feel like this is also and, and don't dream. and don't forget don't forget about salmon and and tuna and swordfish. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, I mean, God, you go up the, to the Pacific Northwest and you can't walk around with somebody hitting you in the side of the head with a piece of salmon to have with your with your Pinot Noir. Um, it, it, it's absolutely fabulous, especially if you're going to cook it on the grill and put a little smoke on it. 
um, and and uh, rare rare tuna. It's absolutely fantastic. Um, it's it's one of the most versatile red wines out there. As long, you know, don't don't. I wouldn't serve it with a big fatty ribeye or a piece of wagyu or something like that, but um, with a fillet or especially pork and all kinds of chicken. It, it, it's, it's really hard to go wrong. I had a little bit um, night before last with some uh, grilled frisée and some just some grilled lettuces with some mm -hmm. uh, red onion. And it was just beautiful. Oh, but it was great. Very simple. Delicious. Yeah, so thank you for sharing this wine with us. We both love it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> on a new love with this Balpon is fabulous. Well, as we're continuing to sip, I'm going to transition over to some art uh, from the same, uh, relatively the same place, the state of Oregon. Uh, not a lot in the collection uh, for, for Oregon, but I found two gems I'd love to share with you all. So the first one we're going to look at is this gelatin silver print photograph by Minor White. It is called Ivy. Portland, Oregon. It's from the Juniper portfolio, which is a collection of prints kind of from across Minor White's career. Um, and Minor White, um, pictured here on the left, um, is really kind of a, a towering figure in the history of photography and the photography world, almost like this Pinot Noir, I feel like, um, goes with, does anything, goes with anything. Um, and he studied with Alfred Stieglitz, so again, a pioneer of American photography. Um, but before he did that, he actually studied botany. That's what he went to school for. So when you're thinking of that, it kind of makes sense with this Ivy um, uh, picture. And um, that's where he sort of started thinking about images as abstract forms. Um, and then studying with Stieglitz that, that definitely influenced him more and more. Um, he actually moved to Portland, Oregon um, in 1938 and was hired by the WPA to document buildings in Oregon, um, including the image that you see here. So this is an early photograph by Minor White. Um, and even though it's of you know, a, a building and definitely a document, document of that building, you can see that kind of play of light and dark and that's really gonna come into his work and style um, and what he's really going to be known for, but also what he teaches. So he um, really is considered one of the founders of the photography department at the California Institute of Art um, and also taught at MIT. Very influential on students. Um, he also founded, was one of the founding editors of Aperture magazine. So if you're a photography um, fan, you're going to know Aperture. So you can thank Minor White for that. Um, and again, that influence from Stieglitz um, in that uh, zone photography, so kind of that, um, that tone of black and white and everything in between is something that he plays with in terms of scale in his photography. And this really comes through on this Ivy Portland, Oregon um, image. And even though he only lived in Oregon for two years, he would constantly come back to the state into Portland and do workshops uh, with photography. He was part of the Oregon Photography Club. So this is a very um, special location for him um, and place. And that's why it's in this Juniper portfolio again, which is a range of photographs across his career, but also subject matter. So just showing you a couple more images from the portfolio, just to show you his range. Um, so on the left, this is called- well, quick, quick, Sorry, I didn't want to interrupt, but we yeah. have a- Quick question about um, where is the building in the Oh, slide? sure. Yeah, sorry. Let me come back. Um, so this is in um, Portland. Um, so Southwest Park Avenue and Montgomery Street. Um, so part of the New Deal Art Project in Portland. Hope that answered that question. Um, so coming back to just two other examples, so nude foot on the left. Um, but again, sort of you see that scale. This is kind of a gray scale. And on the right, this um, amazing sea kind of scape uh, photograph, sun over the Pacific, um, just very ethereal. Um, and this also points to kind of his interest in meditation um, and the I Ching and yin yang, um, this kind of, again, pull between the dark and the light. Um, he actually encouraged his students to really, to, to meditate 
and think of photographs as not just representational, but what is, what's beyond the representation. So connecting emotionally and spiritually with that image that you are capturing. Um, so very philosophical in his approach as well as technical in his approach. Um, like this work again in that Juniper portfolio. So this was taken in the forties. Um, this is a windowsill daydreaming in Rochester, New York. And again, you see that kind of meditative uh, connection and state uh, with the approach and naming this photograph, which is very, you know, it's, it's documenting a window, but there's something otherworldly to it, this kind of uh, altered state um, of daydreaming um, kind of creeps into this, this image. Um, and I have to say, I, just a shout out to my colleague, Jeffrey Allison, for helping me with the minor white, uh, anything photography, I, I just go to Jeffrey for, for some instant tutoring. So thanks, Jeffrey. Um, and then the next work um, that connects to Oregon, again, another educator, this is a uh, Carl Zerbe, um, much like Minor White. So he studied um, in with uh, German expressionist painters in Germany. He's originally from Germany, uh, was born in Berlin, moved to Munich. Um, and he escaped uh, to the Nazis into in 1930s to settle in Boston. Um, in America. And some of his work was actually shown in the, the famous Degenerate Art Show. Um, so he found kind of his home in Boston, um, started teaching in Boston, and really raised the next kind of generation of abstract expressionists in Boston. Uh, this is a picture of him and his fellow um, artists, a modern artist group of Boston. So he's pictured um, the second from the left, that's him. And I just show a, a painting that he did that's in the Detroit Museum of Beacon Hill, just so you can start to see some of his style. Um, and its style just changed kind of much like, um, much like Minor White, you know, he's experimenting. Um, but again, that that through line of kind of abstract expressionism runs into his work. So very quick lines um, and, and feeling. Uh, where is this painting located? Oh, so this, so this one is in Detroit. The one, this one here, Oregon New Building is at the VMFA's collection. It's not on view currently. Um, it's an opaque watercolor on paper, um, which is probably why it's not on view very often because it is very fragile and we would have to rotate it frequently. Um, and we'll talk about kind of why he's in Oregon, moving from Boston. So as I mentioned, he stayed in Boston for several years, um, taught there. And then um, he started experimenting with encaustic um, as a different medium. And encaustic, you know, very traditional medium. Um, he, he, um, it's, it's sort of painting with wax. So you put the wet wax on the canvas and then you heat it to burnish it, um, which kind of freezes it there. And it, it has this very um, shiny um, quality to it. And you can very layer it uh, um, very deeply if you'd like or scale it back. So it has a lot of texture and surface, uh, high surface quality to it. This one is at the Kemper Museum of Art in St. Louis. Um, again, just to show that range. So he did figural work, he did landscape, but all with this kind of um, almost frenetic energy to it. And that takes us back to this piece from our collection, which is um, a building in Oregon. I can't tell you where in Oregon, I'm still sort of trying to figure that out. Um, he was a very prolific artist and he traveled quite frequently in the Pacific Northwest. After he taught in Boston, he moved to Florida State University and helped establish the, the art uh, department there. And again, very influential. Um, teaching was really important to him. Um, and so as he's traveling back and forth, um, he would continue to paint and work even in his travels. Um, and he actually had to stop encaustic because he developed an allergy to it. So his encaustic work is only a short period of time, about 10 years, and then he switched to watercolor. So this is probably kind of a little bit later in his career. Um, but very interesting uh, kind of life and story. Um, and, and I mentioned sort of his abstract work, but this is very much more um, expressionist. This is very more abstract, kind of almost like a cubist work. I almost feel like it's a building that's sort of been deconstructed um, and laid out almost like Picasso would do or George Brock would do. Um, so very minimalist, but if you kind of look closer, again, that layering is happening here. So he's still, still trying to 
get to that encaustic effect, but unfortunately he can't use the encaustic to do that. So just a great example of adaptation um, and, and um, experimentation on the, on the part of Carl Zerbe. Again, something he's sharing with, with Minor White, even though they're working in completely different mediums um, and have that, that, that connection to Oregon in some shape or way, shape or form. All right, so we're gonna head on up to uh, Washington State now and learn a little bit about, or a lot, about the 2017 Keona Vineyards Estate. All right, Turn it back to Tom. I, guess that mean, I guess that means I'm on again. Back on. Okay, so um, the first thing you need to know about Kiona is uh, that Kiona is the Native American word for the Red Hills of this portion of Washington State. Um, it's a, uh, the, the area where they are, it's actually now called the Red Hills AVA, um, Red Mountain AVA. Uh, it is a, as you can see, if you look at the, the map that Celeste just put up, um, that teeny, 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 tiny little uh, red dot. No, move your, there you go. Right there. Right below the R. That teeny tiny little red dot is what is the Red Mountain AVA. And it is undoubtedly the most important AVA of all of Washington State. Um, it, it was it, the, the people that own Kiona, which is John, the, the Williams family, and it was also started with uh, John Jim Holmes. Um, you can see the you can see the the Red Hills in the background. Um, it was founded by them in uh, basically 1975. Um, they, along with the Hedges family and the Leonetti family, are the three families that founded the Red Hills AVA. Um, it, it, it is a ridiculously severe and ridiculously poor area to try and grow grapes in, but it produces tremendous fruit, um, as does a lot of other areas of Southeast Washington State, but the Red Hills in particular. If, if you look at um, all of the great grape growing regions of the world, um, almost all of them, with the exception of Napa Valley and Sonoma Valley and most of California, most of them, the, the, they are all pushed to the edge, absolute edges of viable viticulture, of viable agriculture. Um, and you have to go back hundreds and hundreds of years. If you could grow tomatoes, if you could grow corn, if you could grow potatoes, if you could grow anything that you needed to eat, you grew that. V grapes and wine were a luxury, but they discovered along the way that grapes really liked it where they had to struggle and really liked it where they had to work really, really hard to find water down below the surface and produce the best quality fruit um, where they had to suffer. Um, if you go to some of the areas in Spain and some of the areas in Southern France and Argentina uh, and Italy, you couldn't grow anything else than, than grapes there. Grapes and olive oil, grapes and olives are, are basically it. Um, so Kiona is uh, in their third generation of um, family, growing and family winemaking. Um, they're the owners. They don't own, they don't owe any money to the banks. They don't have any investors. Um, the picture that you're looking, um, that you're looking at right now, the fellow on the, on the left is John Williams. He's the founder. And the fellow in the mill, middle is Scott Williams and he's his son. And the, the fellow on the end is JJ Williams. And, uh, and he is Scott's son. And the fellow that's missing from the picture is Tyler Williams, who is um, JJ's brother, who is currently the winemaker. Um, they, they currently sell, they actually sell more fruit than they use 
for their own wines. Um, they have always farmed 100% organically. Um, they don't spray any herbicides. They don't spray any pesticides. Um, it's one of the benefits of growing grapes out in the middle of a, of a desert um, because you really don't have to worry about mold. You really don't have to worry about bugs and, and insects. Um, they planted their first vines in 1975. They sold their first fruit to another winery in 1978. And in 1980, they produced their first wine under their own name. Uh, one of my absolute favorite stories about Kiona is um, when John and uh, John Williams and Jim Hol Holmes started the winery. They were both engineers and they had come up from California and they decided that they really wanted to, um, they really wanted to make wine. And they um, did a lot of research. I think they were both of their engineering backgrounds were in geologic engineerings and they had done a lot of research and they had decided that this, this plot of land had water on it, um, had water under it. Um, which is unusual for uh, this part of Columbia Valley, this part of Washington State. And they, they hired a guy, they had $500, and they hired a guy to come up and drill. And the guy came up and started drilling. And he drilled one hole, didn't find any water. Drilled another hole, didn't find any water. Drilled three, four, five, six more holes, couldn't find any water. And finally he said, boys, how much money you got left? And they said, we got $50 left. And he said, all right, that'll get you another 100, that'll get you another 100 feet. And he drilled another 25 feet into the last hole that he had started and hit water. <laughs> and, and, and the guy looked at him, he says, boys, you were right. There's water here. Um, so that's, basically how Kiona Vineyards got started um, with, a, with a, a $500 bet that they could find water on this, in the middle of this absolute desert um, down in Southwest, uh, Southeast Washington State. Um, this is a blend of, let's see if I can close this and view. I can tell you. So yeah, if you have it while, while Tom's working on that, just go ahead and start pouring into your glass. Okay, so we'll exit that. And there's a question too, not to- Go ahead. You multitask, Tom. Uh, but both wines are organic. Is that the norm for both regions? Um, no, it absolutely is not. Um, it's, it's, it's getting- more of the norm for both of those regions, but it's sort of the norm for us as a company. Um, we have kind of made it a, a, a point of trying to work with more organic and biodynamic um, producers over the years. Um, and we are, we, when, when somebody is farming organically, um, or, or biodynamically, we, we are more likely to be attracted to doing business with them. Um, but it's, it's, becoming, it's becoming more of the norm in the business because people are realizing that it's just, it's the better thing to do, it's the right thing to do. Um, you know, when you're making wines that cost five and six and seven dollars on the grocery store shelves, um, to put it as as frankly as I can put it, that's the stuff that's giving the 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 the, the people that work in the vineyards cancer. Um, that that's the the stuff that it has so much additives added into it. I, I don't know why people would want to drink it. Um, so that's a roundabout answer. That's a roundabout answer to to that to that question. Um, so this, so the Kiona is, um, it's 54% Columbia Valley fruit and 46% Red Mountain fruit. The, the fruit that comes off a of Red Mountain is 
unbelievably valuable and unbelievably expensive fruit. The fact that this wine is almost half Red Mountain fruit and can they can sell it to you for what they can sell it for is, is absolutely crazy. Um, these people to me are genuine heroes up on Red Mountain. They still make a 100% organically grown, estate grown, estate bottled Lemberger. Nobody in the United States drinks Lemberger. <laughs> we, we sell 20 or 25 cases of their Lemberger a year. And it's the most fabulous thing in the world. If they, if they change those vineyards over to uh, Cabernet, they could get five times the amount of money for that fruit. They still make ice wine on Red Mountain from Chenin Blanc. They still make Riesling that they sell for 12 and $13 a bottle from Red Mountain fruit. That's just absolutely amazing. Um, the, these people are not at all concerned with making money. They're concerned with making wines that they can be proud of and making wines that they like to drink and making wines that they like to sell to their family and their neighbors. Um, this one is 90% Cabernet, 6% Petit Verdot, 2% Sangiovese, and 2% Lemberger. So, and I'm going to try, try and get back to the, to the Zoom <laughs> meeting and, and view option. So Liz and, Liz and Greg, what are you getting off of this wine? I get so much fruit. It is yeah. a fruit for deliciousness immediately. I mean, um, it's so interesting if you look at how close these two are on the map and how different the wines are, so completely different. Um, I mean, but they're different varietals, but um, yeah, so much fruit on it. And it is a very nice clean finish, um, which I really appreciate. So um, when you have that much fruit up forward, it's nice that it like brings you somewhere instead of, you know, just kind of wearing out as welcome, you know what I mean? <laughs> so I think it's lovely in that sense. Yeah, this, this wine punches way above its price range. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So and it's not, it's not that sappy, gloppy, Kind of kind of stuff that you get, you know. That I I was talking earlier about the um, the diurnal difference. Um, the the uh, Washington State, this area of Washington State, has recorded some of the most extreme diurnal differences between daytime temperatures and nighttime temperatures in the entire United States. It can go from 115 degrees during the day to to 60 or 50 degrees at night. And that's what gives you that, uh, that great acidity and that yeah. snap and that pop and that prettiness, um, as opposed to just being a, a great big giant gloppy goopy mess. Yeah, it's lovely. Um, it truly is. So we decided that um, maybe um, something with a little spice to it. So that what you're looking at here is some empanadas that have um, a variety of vegetables. There's uh, cabbage, there's carrots, there's peppers, there's uh, red curry. There's, uh, again, to double up a little bit of pork in here um, to balance everything out. And underneath is a little bit of a uh, avocado puree. And, um, you know, my thought was that the uh, a little bit of spice to, um, to go along with that fruit forward and then uh, just a little bit of the pork and the smooth texture of an avocado to, to uh, balance out the finish. Yeah, it was definitely a different pairing. We, I think we were going some, for something a little bit different. We tried some, we thought of other things first, mm -hmm. but we wanted to kind of do something a little bit different. And the empanadas definitely were. A little bit of uh, fat was nice with this wine, with the acid and um, with the fruit forward quality of the wine. Um, we wanted that it went well with that red curry. So that's why we went in that direction. On the other hand, we also tried a little bit of a uh, goat cheese nudie or a little bit of a, uh, like a goat cheese dumpling type of, of thing that was very, good. very tasty as well. Um, yes, I don't have Patricia Green on my list right now. That's you, isn't it, Tom? You it absolutely is. So we will be getting back the Ribbon Ridge, but we had bought, it was out of stock, right? When we were, we were doing it, so we got the it. Ribbon Ridge is out of stock. We've got we've got some of the we've got some of the reserve. 
Um, we don't have any of the estate right now. But when you do, you've got my number. So we'll put yes. it back on the list whenever, whenever they get more of the ribbon ridge in. Yeah, I'll holler. Thank you. Um, Sue says, put the goat cheese dumpling on the menu. Okay. <laughs> it's that easy. <laughs> Consider it done. It will be on the brunch menu on Sunday. How about that? Perfect. There you go. <laughs> um, so thinking about uh, pairing, so we've talked about food pairing. I'm gonna, we're gonna skip over to the art pairing um, and highlight two uh, works from Washington State. Um, and the first work we're gonna look at actually um, um, honors the namesake of the vineyard as a connection. So Kiona um, as a Native American word. Um, the work that we're gonna look at is from the Yakima culture. Um, so you can see the map there, um, the Yakima Federation, um, which is close to um, the Red Hills. Um, and this is a confederated tribe and band. Um, and you can see their, their flag here. Um, and just as a note um, to recognize the Native American um, tribes where the museum sits, um, we recognize the Powhatan Confederacy and the Monacan Nation as the original owners of the land on which the VMFA is situated. The museum is actually working on a land, formal land acknowledgement with the 11 federally um, and state recognized tribes of Virginia. So be on the lookout for that. Uh, we're working directly with the tribes and that soon will be confirmed, we hope, um, in the next few months. So I do want to recognize um, our Native American groups as well. Um, and the Yakima Nation um, made this piece. This is about 1875. This is a flat case parflesh that's in the collection. This is on view now in our Native American galleries, um, made as a trade piece um, or to be used um, and speaking with um, our curator of Native American art um, was really helpful. Um, and also I have to give a shout out to one of our reference librarians, um, Michelle, who has helped me with the Carl Zebby. It takes a village here at VMFA. Um, we all work together to, to research and um, you know, bring this art to you. So thanks to my colleagues. Um, and this particular piece, again, um, would have been made probably by a woman um, and used um, on a saddle. So to carry documents or important, um, important uh, belongings um, for travel or made for trade. Um, and parflesh is actually a French term, um, which means deflecting arrows. So it's made from rawhide, so would not be able to, the arrows and would have been very strong against arrows. And again, if you're carrying it on your saddle or with you, that's really an important thing to have. Um, and this piece is actually very intricate. Um, you can see the designs here, but also the tassels that are hanging down. Um, it's really rare to find something like this that is, that is this embellished um, and has the original tie. Um, so again, I'd encourage you to go see this in person because you can really see the texture of the piece. Um, so made from Buffalo Rawhide um, by the Yakima people. And I just share, we don't know, who, again, who made this piece. Again, probably a woman, but I just wanted to share um, an image from the Washington State University archive. They have an amazing archive of Native American documents um, that have been digitized and photographs. This is from about 1903. Um, so if you're interested in Native American arts, particularly from this region, the Yakima um, peoples, I definitely encourage you, I put the website there um, to go see their website and dig into their archives. It really has some really rich images and documents. Um, another artist from the Wa Washington state that um, has found a home uh, in terms of pieces that's very iconic now at the museum is Dale Chihuly. So our red reeds that are in our sculpture garden, again, if you've been to the museum um, or even have just seen the museum on the, on the web, you're gonna see this image. Um, this has had really become synonymous with the museum um, and our sculpture garden. Um, if you're looking out at a muse or in the best cafe, you see this. Um, this is an image probably taken around this time of night, actually. Um, look at that, not planned. Um, so Chihuly um, had a show here in 2012. Um, and this work was a site-specific work created specifically for the Sculpture Garden as part of that show. 
Um, and then we ended up acquiring the piece. Um, so it remained on view in situ um, at the museum. It's probably one of the largest installations of his reads that he has done. Um, these are individually um, blown pieces. And he got this idea when he did Chihuly over Venice um, and was making this in Scandinavia actually. And what's um, new and inventive about this is annealing ovens that are this, they're extremely large. So he would, uh, assistants would kind of hold the hot glass and blow into it and let the glass kind of drip down, almost like melted crowns. And that's how you get that kind of elongated effect. And the annealing ovens were, were large enough so they could fire um, and harden the glass here. This is Dale here um, in the middle here with the, with the eye patch. Um, and he is sort of sees himself as a composer, kind of directing um, glass blowing. Um, he can't do the glass blowing as much because of um, an accident. He was in a car accident in the 70s where he lost his eye. Um, so now he's definitely is a collaborator, um, director, and kind of visionary for um, the Chihuly glass works. Also an educator, again, we come back to this theme, um, and also a collector. So he started as a weaver and then started weaving glass into his weavings, but also very influenced by Native American art. So this is another connection back to Kiona in a way, um, connecting Navajo blankets. So this is from his collection. This is an installation shot um, in, the, in the 2012 exhibition. You can also see basketry on the left. And he's using these influences um, in glass blowing as well. In the center there um, are glass vessels. Um, yes, love Chihuly, Sue, and you visited this, yep, yeah, his museum under the needle, yep. So he still has um, roots in Washington State. Um, and Holchuk, which is the um, school that he founded, glass blowing school is still there. So again, very influential um, in glass making and artists moving forward. And just another shot of the reeds because I just can't resist. Um, when you come to the museum, and hopefully you can, you know, we are open. Um, Sculpture Garden is open all the time. You can stroll through um, and spend some time. Um, okay, so Julie's asked, oh, why does having one eye prevent him from blowing glass? So it's kind of a depth perception issue when you're dealing with, with hot glass and if you're pulling it, um, you definitely need a partner to do that. So it's very, it was difficult for him to do. And I think he's also kind of wants to promote the, um, the teamwork philosophy um, and really push that forward with his staff to give them sort of ownership in the making process. Um, so uh, kind of like a um, sort of you're directing, again, sort of like an orchestra. So the conductor might not be playing the instruments, but he's leading the team in doing so um, and still has that creative um, pull and influence. Um, on the output. And that's, that's, that's kind of the best analogy that I can, that I can give, give for that. Oh, and thank you, Sue. The museum is super safe. Yes, it is. Um, so do encourage you, you know, we, we have distancing in place, you know, um, hand sanitizer, masks are required. Um, we keep an eye on capacity. So yes, it is very safe to visit and we encourage you to do so. Would these wines be available at tastings? We have uh, both of the wines will be available by the glass start or by the bottle starting tomorrow. But I do feature all of our um, our wine selections on these tastings on our menu until we run through them. So yeah, they'll be on the menu by the glass uh, tomorrow. All right. Well, if there's out to any, oh, he means the place in oh oh tastings the place in Charlottesville. Capital T A S T I N G S. I don't know, Tom. Uh, you could always call him and ask. Uh, I, I he's not one of my accounts, um, but you can uh, you can call Bill and and see if he has um, the Belpont or the um, or the the Kiona, um, or you you can always um, just uh, buy them from the lovely folks here at the museum. Uh, and Kelly's sharing, we got Belpente. I see, I just keep doing it. Terrible. It's okay. <laughs> it's just, I like, I'm mean, Italian is just ingrained in my mind. Um, at Vino Verde, Veritas in Charlottesville. Yeah. 
and and they can they anybody in Charlottesville can always special order any of these wines for you if uh, if you want. They we delivered all of the independent wine shops in in Charlottesville. Well, thank you all so much, um, Liz, Greg, and Tom, for just taking the time and um, spending it with with uh, us. Um, and sharing the food pairings, your knowledge about the wine, knowledge about the food. We really appreciate it. And thank you all of to you who, who joined us tonight for your questions and your impressions. Um, we really appreciate you setting aside some time uh, to be on Zoom um, and taste the wines with us and look at some art. So I encourage you to join us for the next Taste of Art program sponsored by Chase. And thank you to our sponsor. Um, Friday, March 26th, we'll be welcoming Center of the Universe Brewing. And then on uh, Friday, April 9th, wine again. So stay tuned for, um, for what we'll be featuring um, for April 9th. If you're interested in watching this again or any other programs you might have missed, please, please tune into our YouTube channel. All of those are available. Um, this one will be up probably next week. Um, and encourage you to come back again and stop by and meet us when you can. So thanks everyone for tuning in and have a great evening. Thank, Thank you. you for including me. I enjoyed it. I looked at, I look forward to doing one again. Absolutely. Thanks, Tom. Bye, Thanks. everybody. Bye. Thanks, Liz. Thanks, Celeste.